Temptation. When I hear that word, I um, the, the probably mostly juvenile part of me goes back to when I was a kid. And uh, you might remember those cartoons. There's always somebody in this cartoon that's trying to make some decision. Do I do this or do I do that? And then somewhere in the midst of his decision making, two little things pop up on his shoulder, right? An angel and a devil. And so then he spends the next 30 seconds or so with the angel and the devil arguing back and forth, and his head's kind of going like this, until finally he may or may not make the right decision. It's funny because we think temptation is something that we inherit as adults. You know, one day we just grow up, uh, we wake up as an adult, and temptation is there. But I don't think that's true. In fact, I think, I think we deal with temptation from a very, very young age. I mean, just look around. Go to a shopping mall, or Chuck E. Cheese, or a playground, or any place where there's children, and just watch one of them for a while. And what you'll find is that every child, everywhere, has their favorite temptation. It's true. Now, for one child, it might be something like this. Mom, 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 mommy, mother, mom, mom, mom. Right? They can't resist. Or another child may just throw himself down in a screaming tantrum, beat his hands and feet on the ground until he gets what he wants. Every child has their favorite temptation. And, and I've had three kids, and I tell you that I know this because each of my three kids has had their own favorite temptation. My, my oldest daughter, Erica, when she was old enough to walk, we, used to, we lived in an apartment, and so it wasn't a very big stretch from the living room to the back of where the bedrooms were. But her favorite temptation was to go into the bathroom, grab onto the toilet paper, and take it all the way down the hallway. And she was really good at getting the whole roll of toilet paper off of the roll without tearing. I mean, try that. It's not easy. But she did that. Every time she got a chance, we knew there was toilet paper coming down the hallway. Now, Chris... My son, he's back there, by the way. He's going to love him to tell me this. His, his favorite temptation was to jump off of things. No matter where we were, home, a restaurant, a store, a parking lot, the desert, the beach, if he could find something that was more than two inches high, he would immediately run up to it, jump off, and then run around and do the same thing again. Over and over and over, no matter how many times we told him not to do it. And Emily's favorite temptation was, and we knew, Every time Emily was silent for a while, we knew what she was doing. She would go into the kitchen and get the cereal out of the bottom cabinet. And eventually, we'd just see her little two-year-old self walking in with a box of rice chips that was her favorite, eating the cereal. Until one day, she accidentally grabbed a box of dog food. <laughs> True story, and we had to put a lock on the cabinet to stop her from doing that. Now, my favorite temptation, uh, probably because I was a terrible, awful, rotten child was that I loved to hide from my mother. I loved to hide from my mother in every situation possible. And I don't know whether it was because I truly was a rotten child, which is probably the case if you ask anybody that knew me then. Or, or maybe I just like to hear the panic in my mom's voice looking for me. But, but I loved to hide from my mom. And one of the favorite ways I like to do that. Now, I have a brother. You guys know that. And, and she used to take us shopping with her quite often. And you know that in like JCPenney and Macy's and Heck Company and all those places, they have these round racks that clothes hang on. Did you also know that inside of those racks is a little hole? Did you know that? And so my favorite place to hide was in the middle of those racks. And it wasn't just enough to hide in the middle of the rack, because after a while my mom knew if she couldn't find me, I was hiding in the middle of the rack. I had to go to the next apartment <laughs> or the next floor so that she would, you know, have to look for it. It was like hide and seek. I thought it was fun. And I remember this one time we were in Toys R Us. And Toys R Us back in my day was way different than it is now. The one that's up in Glenburnie, where the Glenburnie Mall used to be. Now it's a little tiny thing, but it used to be almost the whole entire side of Glenburnie Mall at one time. And, and they, they sold more than just toys. Now it's just toys, but they used to sell all kinds of stuff in there. And, and in the summer, they sold swimming pools. And they had a swimming pool set up in the middle of the store. And my mom took a shopping at Toys R Us one time. Now can you imagine me, who likes to hide from my mother, 
coming across the swimming pool in the middle of a store with a ladder. I mean, they were stupid enough to put the ladder there on the pool. I'm like, this is the holy grail of hiding places. And so as soon as I could get away from my mother's eye, that's where I am, right to that swimming pool. And as I got closer and closer and closer, I noticed that it wasn't just a swimming pool. It was a swimming pool full of pillows. I climbed up on that ladder and did a swan dive right into those pillows and swam around, and I got the worst butt whooping I ever had in my whole entire life that night, and that was probably the last time I ever hid from my mom. But we all have our favorite temptation as a kid, and then sometimes we carry those childhood temptations with us into adulthood. I mean, we all have these things. They don't really hurt. They're, you know, childhood kind of temptations. They're like, do I eat this piece of pie? Do I have a second helping? Do I sleep in today or do I get up and work out? You know, if we make the wrong decision there, it's really not hurting us. But then we do inherit what I would call grown-up temptations, where the stakes are much higher, where, where the temptations are much bigger, where they can affect lots of different parts of our life. And then we have this really unusual thing that happens. And I'm not sure whether it's tied to our walk with God, or whether it's just a part of kind of everyone's life, but, but for some people, temptation isn't even really a thing. They're in this phase of their life where it's like a challenge, right? It's not a temptation, it's a challenge. It's a conquest. It's a rite of passage. You just go out and do those things. You know, it's not really a big deal, or, or maybe, you know, temptation only applies to those things like diets and food and working out. Or, or maybe it's your temptation. But I don't have a problem with that. For some people, it's just non-existent. And the reason for that is, is that our condition of sin hides the fact that we're even being tempted. This condition of sin we suffer from hides the fact that it really is temptation. It really is something that can hurt us. Remember, a few months ago, we played this video from Paul Harvey. And Paul Harvey said, if I were the devil, I would put in front of you all these things that seemed really good but we're really bad, temptation, because that's how it works. Now, once we get past that, once we become a person of faith, then we start to feel something, right? We start to feel that maybe this is not the right thing, or maybe this is the, it is the right thing, or, or whichever way we go, or, or should I be doing this? And then, then, mysteriously and wonderfully, this word temptation becomes something that is present in our vocabulary the whole time. Either way, whether we call it temptation or whether we call it challenge, the stakes are just the same. And the consequences are just the same. And the outcome is just the same. Inevitably, we will end up with feelings of guilt and shame, broken relationships, shattered lives, pieces falling all around in our life that we just can't pick up. And those things will stay broken for sometimes years and sometimes even lifetimes. Just because we choose not to call it temptation isn't going to change the outcome. And no matter what we call it, I've noticed that most people believe that we can fight temptation with willpower. If I just have enough willpower, if I just have enough inner power, and when we say willpower, really what we're talking about here is my power, my own power, right? Willpower, my power. If we just have enough of that, if we just have enough willpower, I can beat this temptation. If I just have enough willpower, I won't do that thing. If I just have enough willpower, I'll be okay. Interesting concept, but, but if that were true, if it were true that we could just get rid of temptation with willpower, then wouldn't we eventually run out of temptation? I mean, eventually, somewhere in our 30s or 40s or 50s, all the things that could be tempting to us would have come up, and we would have just willpowered them all away, and we'd be cruising the rest of our life. No temptation whatsoever. If that were true, we would have just willed it all away. But temptation never goes away, does it? When I was between the ages of 18 and mid-twenties or so, you guys know my story, that I felt very early in my life a call from God and then decided to run in the other direction. And during that period of time, uh, that was my, it's a challenge phase. 
right? It wasn't temptation. It was a challenge. And, and, and seriously, there wasn't a party I wouldn't go to. There wasn't a girl I wouldn't try to date. There wasn't an alcohol I wouldn't drink. There were not many drugs I didn't try. True. Terrible part of my life. And what I realized is that I liked, at the time, the way all those things made me feel. Because they all gave me some sense of something better, at least that's what I thought, than what I had before. Right? If somebody gave me their attention, some girl gave me their attention, it made me feel good inside because we all want to feel loved. We all want to feel wanted. If I took an extra drink, I was the life of the party. And that made me feel good. People liked me. And what I realized is that the reason we can't will temptation away is because temptation doesn't attack our will. We think it does. We think temptation is a matter of willpower. But what temptation attacks is our feelings. Temptation takes these feelings and your memories and it says, remember how you felt when you did that? Remember how you could feel if you did this again? And that's what temptation attacks. It doesn't attack our willpower. Temptation feasts on feelings. That's what gives it fuel. That's what gives it drive. And the truth is, temptation never goes away. No matter who we are, no matter what we do, it's always there because we're human. We can't get rid of our feelings. We're always going to feel something, and we're always going to associate that feeling with something we did, and then temptation, the tempter, the devil, is going to put, put that in our head and say, do you remember that? If or when we ever get to that point where we realize that temptation isn't going away, then what do we do about it? There will come a point in all of our lives where we just realize that we can't will it away. We can't get rid of our feelings. Temptation isn't going away, so what do we do then? How do we handle that? And the answer sounds simple, and really it is. We turn to Jesus. And we say this all the time here at Hope Springs Community Church, that Jesus gave up his position in heaven to become human so that he would know our conditions. He would go through the things that we went through. He would walk this earth so that he could understand what it is that we, fallible humans, go through. And temptation is no different. But what I find interesting is that, um, excuse me, my throat's a little right here. What I find interesting is that if we are supposed to model Jesus in the way he handles temptation. There is only one account, one account in the New Testament of Jesus ever being tempted. One account. It's in three Gospels. It's in Matthew and Luke's Gospel as a complete account. And then Mark kind of gives it a sentence and a half overview. And actually Matthew is where we are today. There's one account. Let me set this up. Jesus had just started his ministry. And he had picked his guys, he's got his posse with him, and uh, he's traveling around and he comes up on John the Baptist. Now John the Baptist had for a long time been proclaiming that the Messiah was coming, that the Son of God, that, that, that Jesus was coming. And, and so sure enough, Jesus walks up on John the Baptist and John's preaching and baptizing people in the river and he looks at Jesus and he says, there is the Lamb of God. And Jesus has John baptize him right there in the river. And immediately after Jesus comes out of the water, the Holy Spirit descends on Jesus. And that's the same thing that happens to us when we accept Jesus in our lives and make him more of our life. The Holy Spirit descends on us, and that's important, as we'll find out in just a minute. But Jesus had just received the Holy Spirit, and right after that is where we come into our, our, our text here. And here's what the story says. Then... Immediately after that, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And then the devil took him to the holy city, so this would be Jerusalem, and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. 
So here Jesus is at the highest point of the temple, looking over the whole temple and all of Jerusalem. And the temple's not a small, it's not like church, like we think. It's, it's a big place with inner courts and outer courts. And he's got Jesus up there and he says, he says, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. And they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put your Lord, your God, to the test. And then the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. So all the known world that there was at that point in time, they could see from this vantage point. All this I will give to you, he said, if you bow down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And then the devil left him, and angels came to attend him. Now Luke's, this is just for free, by the way, Luke's account of this story is almost identical, with one exception. Luke ends his story this way. He says, And Satan departed from Jesus until an opportune time. You see, Satan didn't think he was finished with Jesus. And in fact, we know that's true because he attacked him again on the cross. But this time, he lost. He lost forever. And, and, and I think it's interesting that there is truly only one account of Jesus ever being tempted. And here's why. In this one story, in this one account of Jesus' temptation, he has taught us everything, everything, we need to know about dealing with temptation. So we're going to break this down. We're going to learn all of what Jesus is teaching us. And the first thing we notice here is the Holy Spirit. Jesus had just received the Holy Spirit, and we just said that we also receive the Holy Spirit when we accept Jesus as our Savior. And the Spirit led Jesus out into the wilderness to be tempted. When I read that, I was kind of confused. I'm like, why in the world would the Holy Spirit ever lead Jesus out into the desert to be tempted? Doesn't seem right. And if you really look at the meaning of that word tempted, it, it means to be tested or to be prepared or to be made ready for something that's coming. And this is very common if you look back at the Old Testament when, when people were going to, going to do God's work or God had sent them and wants to send them on a mission or they needed to do something important. They would go out into the desert and fast and commune with God and make themselves ready and, and just kind of purify themselves for a period of time before they went and did what God told them to do. So it makes perfect sense that Jesus, at the beginning of his ministry, would go out and prepare by himself to commune with God and the Holy Spirit for what's coming in the next three or so years of his life. But what I find interesting is that we, we have this, this misconception that the closer we are to God, the less susceptible we are to temptation. Isn't that true? We believe that. If I'm really, really close to God, I'm just walking right there and I feel Him, I'm praying, I'm reading scripture, all that. The, the closer we are, then the temptation probably isn't something we have to worry about. But that's just simply not true. And we see that in Jesus' story because I'm sure He was closer to God than He had ever been. And in that sweet communion, He is still susceptible to temptation. And sometimes it might even be worse because... <laughs> Satan doesn't like it when we get close to God. So he's going to throw up everything he can to separate us from him. And speaking of Satan, the tempter, that's how it works. And he tempts Jesus in four specific ways. And I'm sure there are more ways that we can be tempted, but really if we examine our temptations and get right to the root of what's going on, we can probably fit them all into one of these categories. The first thing that Satan does, knowing that Jesus had been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he attacked him at his needs, his physical needs and his emotional needs. He knew that Jesus was hungry, and he said to him, well, then why don't you just turn this stone into bread? Now, of course, Jesus could turn the stone into bread. He performed miracle upon miracle in his ministry. There was no question Jesus could do it, but what Satan wanted was Jesus to do it because he told him to. That's what Satan does. He appeals to our needs. I mean, think about this. Husband and wife have an argument one day, and they're kind of like this. Hmm. Gee. Hmm. 
kind of that thing, you know, and they just don't talk to each other before they leave for work. And then, you know, the husband's still a little ticked off, so he stays out a little bit late that night, comes home, and they, they don't talk to each other that night. The next morning, they're just kind of glaring at each other over their coffee, no words. And then the next thing, one day turns into another, into another, and this little tiny thing has blown up into something big. And all the needs that get met when we have a closeness with our spouse, with our significant others, all that, all those needs aren't being met anymore. So then one day the husband's at work and, he, and his secretary just gives him a look. And that look turns into a conversation. And one day that conversation turns into lunch and that lunch turns into a hotel room after work. You see, when we, when we are far away from a need, something that we need in our lives, Satan jumps on that. And he immediately throws up something that seems so good, so tempting, that would feel just right in that moment. That's the way he works. He attacks our physical and our emotional needs. And then, and this is a tricky one. We don't even realize this is happening sometimes. He attacks our security blanket. He does. One of the things that we always say about God, and it's true, is that God is always walking with us. If God is for us, who can be against us? He is our protector, our shield. He's our defender. We just sang about that. His love defends us. Notice what Satan did. Satan is so crafty, he even quoted scripture. He said, Jesus, throw yourself off the temple because if God is who God says he is, then he will lift you up and he will keep you safe. So just go ahead and do it. I've had friends actually say, I know I'm saved. God's grace has affected me. But you know what? I'm covered. So I'm just going to do it anyway. But Paul, the apostle, says, uh, just because grace is free doesn't mean we should continue to sin so that we make grace look even better than it is. There is something in us that needs to want to change. But Satan says, oh, you know, your God says that he's going to protect you. So go ahead. It's okay. God will, take, God will take care of it. He's got your back. And then Satan attacks power and greed, this, this thing that we love, as humans especially. We all love power. And we all love things. And we all love stuff. He says, I will give you all of this land. The whole world, well, the world was already Jesus' world. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. So Satan wasn't really giving him anything, but what he wanted was for Satan, uh, for Jesus to bow down to Satan so that Satan might give up a little bit of his control over this earth while he's here. And we all love power. We all have known that co-worker who... <clears throat> maybe not so scrupulously has stepped over someone's back to get the promotion. Or maybe we've done it ourselves where we might take credit for some work that really wasn't ours. Or, you know, you're just always chasing the dollar. And the funny thing is about power and greed, and especially in this example, is that it's almost always at the expense of some relationship. And these people who work 80, 90, 100 hours a week are leaving their family without them. They're separating themselves from that relationship. And if Jesus had, had taken this temptation, if Jesus had responded to this, he would have really seriously hindered the relationship he had with God because now he would be worshiping someone else other than God. Power and greed can affect our relationships. And the fourth way that Satan has tempted Jesus is by going right to his ego. Twice, twice, Satan says, if you are the son of God, if you're the son of God, turn the stone into bread. If you're the son of God, then he will protect you. He does that. He wanted Jesus to use his power for himself and not for God. How many times have, have, have you seen people say things like this, especially in our younger years? And I know I was susceptible to this. You know, and, and it happens a lot with men. I can't speak for women because I wasn't a young woman ever. <laughs> a couple buddies around. 
And then inevitably somebody says something like this. What are you, a wimp? Meaning, if you were a real man, you'd do it. If you were a real man, you'd take that shot. If you were a real man, you'd go ask her out. It happens. We all like our ego to be stroked, don't we? And all of these, all of these, these temptations, these ways that, that Satan kind of battles with us through temptation, they all appeal to our feelings because it feels good to have our needs met. It feels good to know that God's got our back even when we're not doing the right thing, even though we should be doing the right thing. But it feels good. Power feels good. Stuff feels good. When our ego gets stroked, it feels good. The way Satan works. But I told you that this one story, this one account, has everything we need to know. And it also has the fix. And the fix is actually way simpler than we ever make it out to be. Because Jesus is tempted three times. Three times. And every time, every time he answers Satan this way, it is written. God's word this. It is written, he says, that we shouldn't live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from God. It is written that we shouldn't test the Lord. It is written that we should worship God only. It is written. See, Satan battles temptation with God's word, and God's word can guide us, God's word can teach us, and it reminds us that temptations only provide these momentary feelings which will always go away and leave us open for more temptation. And that's why, that's why reading your, your Bible, that's why this book is more important than just something to sip my coffee on in the morning. It's important that we open up this book that God inspired through fallible human hands, that we open it up and that we read it. And we always say this, well, I don't understand what it's saying to me. Well, that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. Because the Holy Spirit works in us to understand what God says. In John's Gospel, Jesus said, I will send to you a helper, an advocate, who will teach you everything you need to know. And who will remind you of what I said. That is one of the primary roles of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, by the way, is also the reason that we go from challenge phase to knowing temptation in our life. Because he unveils all the stuff that's hiding the temptation and makes it known to us so that we can incorporate God's word, his truth in our lives to battle temptation. Because temptation feasts on these feelings that we can't get rid of. But God's truth trumps Temptation every time, every time, God's truth trumps temptation. And it's easy. I'm sure I've done it. I know I've done it. It's easy to use feelings as a scapegoat, as an excuse to give in to temptation. I mean, you know, good feelings feel good. Who doesn't want that? It's easy. But they do provide that feast, that fuel. That, that necessary catalyst for temptation. And temptation always feasts on things like the rush we get when we stare just a little too long. And, it, and temptation feasts on how happy I am because I'm the life of the party now because I just had that one more drink. And temptation always feasts on the ego boost I get from stepping over somebody to get that promotion. And it feasts on the excitement of clicking on that website alone in the middle of the night. And it feasts on the high we get from another hit. And it feasts on all those feelings that bring back all those memories. And Satan says, remember that? Go ahead. It's okay. Do it. And we can't fight it with willpower. We can't fight it with our own power, but we can fight it with God's truth. <coughs> His word. With the Holy Spirit's help. We can fight it with God's truth because God's truth trumps this temptation to satisfy our own needs. And it truths, it trumps the temptation to, to just misuse God's care for us. And, and his truth trumps the temptation to glorify ourselves through power and greed. And it trumps the temptation to satisfy our own ego. His truth just trumps it all. And the Holy Spirit helps us to interpret and incorporate and apply God's truth 
in our life. Now maybe, just maybe, you're still in that challenge phase, that conquest phase, that rite of passage phase. You don't see temptation in your life, but I have to tell you that the consequences are all the same. There's going to be guilt and shame and broken relationships and shattered lives and all of those pieces that we talked about earlier. And the longer we let feelings dictate how we respond to temptation, the harder it becomes to resist temptation. It's the way the human brain works. We associate feelings with something. And then we want to feel that again. And so we do that thing again. And it becomes harder and harder and harder to resist temptation when we allow temptation to feast on our feelings. And if that's you, don't you want something different? Wouldn't you like a way to recognize temptation? To, to, to unhide it in your life? And to battle it? And we do that in truth. Jesus. Jesus is the truth that trumps the sin in our lives, that hides the temptation in the first place. And then God's Word is the truth, interpreted by the Holy Spirit, that trumps our desires to give in to that temptation. Or maybe, maybe you're past the conquest phase. Maybe you've been walking with Jesus for a while. Maybe a short while, maybe a long while. And somewhere along the way, you stop hearing the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart. You stop feeling the work of the Holy Spirit. And these temptations just start creeping back in. Do you wonder why? And maybe that's the day that you need to just, today is the day that you need to recommit. And I would ask that anyone here who is suffering from either one of those, either one of those, the conquest phase of our lives where we don't even know the temptation is there, or the fact that we just have dulled the voice of the Holy Spirit through whatever, through not, not being in God's Word, through, through not being close to Him, whatever it is, if, that's, if that voice has stopped speaking to you, either case, today I ask that you just put an end to it. Let Jesus take over. Because either way, wherever you are, the answer is the same. And it started with Jesus on the cross. We have a condition of sin in our lives. And that sin hides temptation. But Jesus came so that at the opportune time, Satan would be defeated. Once and for all. For everyone. All the time. So if you, if you want a way to battle the temptation, which is never going away, it's not willpower. It's truth. It's God's truth. Is today the day that you need to step up and say, I'm tired of doing this myself. I can't do it anymore. I, I cannot fight temptation with willpower. I can't fight it with anything that I can do in my own power. So Jesus, I need you. If today's that day, I'll be happy to pray with you about that. And if today is the day that you are willing to just recommit yourself to the Holy Spirit and listening to Him in your life, then I'm happy to pray with you about that too. Paul or I will be up here after the service. Let's pray. Father, we are desperate for you in our lives. We are a people who, left to our own devices, will always, always lose to the temptation that, that Satan throws at us. We can't do it on our own. Not one of us. Not one of us is strong enough to battle temptation without you, without your truth, without your word that you gave us for just times like these. When temptation is strong, we can turn to your word. When the battle seems hopeless, we can turn to your word. When all seems lost in our lives, when it just is one conquest after another, we can turn to you, and Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. God, I just ask that you work in this room. There are people
people here today who, who are exhausted, done, spent, all the pieces are on the floor and they can't pick them up. There are people here today in that condition and God, I ask you to work on their heart. Allow them to step up and say, I'm done. Jesus, you got it all. You have everything. And there are people today who have been coasting, coasting in this life, claiming Christianity, but yet something just isn't there. The fire is gone. The Holy Spirit has gone silent. And in those people's lives, stir them to step up and make a commitment to get back into your word, to get back into time with you, to get back into opening their hearts to hear the Holy Spirit. God, if that's your will, I just ask you to make that happen today. Thank you for your word, Lord, and, and just passing it down for all these generations so that we know what you want us to know. Because we can't do it without you. God, we pray all these things in the name of your Son, the one who makes it all possible, Jesus Christ. And together as a church, we all say, Amen. Amen.